<laughs> okay, so we're going to go ahead and get going. We're going to bring on uh, David first. And so we can have him for five minutes or so talk about his qualifications and uh, why he thinks he should serve in Congress. And then we'll have some questions uh, uh, for David. And unfortunately, he, like I said, he doesn't have anybody uh, to debate, but uh, at least we'll find out where he stands on the issues, which I'm sure is, uh, is very, very important to his community. So without further ado, uh, David, can you come on up? You will just go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank, Thank you for the time. time. Thanks for thanks for doing this. These are actually, I think, some of the most important opportunities in our communities to allow you to see who I am and talk a little bit about the campaign and hear what I have to say. But very briefly, I want to give you a bit of context, a little more context as to who I am, where I come from, what my own background is, and then talk very briefly about some of the issues that are most important in this campaign, and then of course turn to your questions, and I hope each of you will have one. My wife and I live in La Quinta, on the other side of the hill. My wife's name is Anita, and we live there with our 18-month-old. Her name is Olivia. We adopted Olivia from Ethiopia last year, when she was one month and two weeks old. Uh, my parents, my Parents were both educators. My father still is. He lives in Palm Springs. I'm the only child of a two-educator family. My mother was a, a teacher as well as a, a counselor, but she was the second woman to ever pastor a church in Texas, one of the first women to ever be given her own Presbyterian church. And my father is a Jew from Oregon. They got married over 55 years ago at a time when that was not anything that was done and certainly not something that was accepted by practically anybody. But it's important that I talk about that because it's a lot of who I am. It's a lot of why I stand for what I stand for. And it's important that you know that that's my context. We were introduced at, the, at a Lutheran church in Palm Desert a couple weeks ago on Sunday and then actually up here as well in, uh, in Hemet. And I was introduced like this. This is David, son of two educators. Uh, mother was a, was a minister, father is a Jew, they adopted an Ethiopian child, and his wife is a Lutheran. <laughs> that's important, not only for the campaign, but that's America. That's who we are. And that's so much of what I talk about and what I stand for. My campaign that we have run also reflects that. I think that's vital, as certainly will my congressional office. My background, very quickly, I'm commissioner of higher education here in California, on the California Student Aid Commission. Uh, students who are here, do any of you have Cal grants? That's good. Um, the commission, my commission, Student Aid Commission, is the body that administers the Cal grant program. It's about a $7 billion financial aid program. I was appointed to the Student Aid Commission by Antonio Villaraigosa in the year 2000, and then was elected one of the youngest commissions, one of the youngest chairs of this $7 billion commission about three years ago. I've also been vice president of Occidental College. Have you heard of, heard of Occidental? Okay, good, good. And maybe some of you will transfer to Occidental. Occidental is in Eagle Rock, was vice president of Oxy for about five years, and have been working for really my whole career within academics and public policy to make sure that our communities are thriving. For all of our students, but all of our citizens, our seniors, we need to make sure that government really works for us. My degree, my undergraduate degree is at Reed College. I wrote my thesis on campaign finance reform, which is interesting to be running a congressional race. I'm really running my thesis, living my thesis. My graduate work is in public policy at Claremont Graduate University. So that's a bit of who I am and my background. Hopefully there can be a few more questions about that as well. People always ask me at the outset, why are you running? I can answer that pretty briefly. I'm running because I can't stand still. More than anything, I can't stand still as we become more disgusted with our own government. There's a reason why only 20% of people vote. There's a reason why 75% of the American public believes that Congress is corrupt. I absolutely believe that practically every decision made by this administration, supported by my opponent and her colleagues, has turned America into something that I don't recognize turned America into something that many of us simply do not recognize. We have squandered the goodwill of an entire world since 9-11, and in the process made us, made us much less safe than we ever have been before. A few things that I focus on related to policy, and then we'll 
open it up to questions. Healthcare, education, energy policy. Healthcare first. We're the only industrialized nation on earth without national health care, the only one. It's not like we can look and when you study, you can't study other industrialized nations that don't provide health care for their people because they don't exist. We're the only one. Why are we the only one? Because my opponent and so many others have accepted literally tens of thousands of dollars from health insurance companies, from pharmaceutical companies. They have had the voice. You have not had the voice. Very simply put, every criminal is entitled to, is guaranteed, an attorney. Every sick child is not entitled to a doctor. It's a dramatic example of, I think, a wrong-headed policy that creates the situation where so many people have to choose between the medical care they need or the groceries they need. We should have nobody ever making that choice. We need single-payer health care, like even Democrats, Republicans alike are advocating for. The Republican governor of Massachusetts is doing this in his state because the nation has not acted. We have to act. Energy policy, we need real energy policy. We need to, to have been investing in and investing now in what will be the next phase of how we power our life. What will be the next way we power our cars and power our homes? We're facing an environmental and an energy crisis now that is unprecedented. It's not uh, it's not a thought, it's not an exaggeration, it's a fact. We're running out of oil, we're running out of petroleum, we are paying the highest gas prices in history, and just let's be clear, gas prices will fall right until Election Day, right until about November 7th, and then just wait if we don't have a new Congress. Why again? Because Exxon, Chevron, Ex Chevron, Texaco, Mobil, when they are making $10 billion a quarter in profit, not just $10 billion in sales, $10 billion a quarter in profit, there is no incentive to change. When the CEO of major oil companies are making almost half a million dollars a year, there's no incentive to change. And when my opponent has taken literally tens of thousands of dollars from oil companies, there's similarly no incentive for change. We should have been investing in alternative energies literally decades ago. We should have been requiring that new construction be green construction. We should have made where we live, here in this valley and over the hill in the Coachella Valley, these should be the Silicon Valley of sustainable energy. 355 days of sunshine per year on the other side of the hill. Potential wind energy, geothermal energy, the plants that will be creating and the people and the businesses that will be creating the future, they're not here. They should be here. Education, just very briefly, and it's wonderful to be able to be in an institution of higher education. But as you know, this is a luxury that too many of our students do not get. We actually have, in my congressional district, the lowest percentage of students going on to higher education in the whole state of California, and actually one of the lowest in the nation. The lowest rate of students minimally eligible for our state schools, for the CSU or the UCs, come from my congressional district. One of the highest dropout rates as well. Those are not circumstances simply out of circumstance. Those are not statistics out of circumstance. They're out of neglect. <clears throat> Riverside County is one of the fastest growing counties in the entire nation. Yet we receive, in the state of California, we are second to last in receipt of federal money. So just be very clear, one of the fastest growing counties receiving some of the least federal dollars. So we wonder why our schools don't have the resources they need, our roads don't, our seniors don't. It's because we haven't had someone in Congress who will show up and do the work necessary to bring benefits back home. This is an election about changing what happens in Washington, literally changing the entire conversation in Washington so that we can change what happens here. So that's my introduction. Thank you for the time. I look forward to any and all questions. We all can begin by asking, as all of us know that follow politics, the Iraq war is a, is a huge campaign issue. Yep. And I guess everyone would like to hear, uh, what is your take on the Iraq war? I realize asking you to give a short answer to 
to that especially, kind of question. Especially an academic, that's tough. Yeah, it's, that I know. Tough. It's, it's very hard to do, but, I'll do but it. obviously the next Congress is going to have to be part of the decision making yep. as to what is going to happen in Iraq as we approach the 2008 presidential election. So if we were to elect you to Congress, what would you try to do in terms of the Iraq war? Yep. I'll just let you answer. Uh, we actually had a press conference about that a couple weeks ago. I laid out a very specific set of plans. Bottom line, this administration, my opponent, has gotten us into a historic mess in Iraq. A historic mess where we are spending, literally, we have spent so much of our nation's treasure, my daughter's future, to fight a war which has benefited so few people at the expense of so many. Let's be very clear. We actually, when I'm in Congress, one of the things we need to do immediately is have members of this Congress and the administration stop saying that the war on terror is related to the war in Iraq. They need to stop saying it because it's not true. They need to just simply stop. There was no connection between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. There was no connection between Al-Qaeda and Iraq. But what we have done is taken our eye off the ball. Taken our eye off the ball. If we really wanted to keep us safe, we would make sure that our containers coming in on our ships were inspected. We would make sure that we implemented the 9-11 Commission recommendations. We haven't done any of that. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Now, another issue that several people ask about is illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an obvious one, you being so close to Mexico. Sure. And what is your position on the general problem of, of illegal immigration? I'll just leave it as open as sure. a real open question. Um, that's also obviously a very complex topic because a lot of times what people are really asking relates to security. A lot of times that question is about how do you keep us safe. So I'll address it that way and then go a little bit farther. My first priority is to keep us safe. My first priority in Congress is to make sure that we as a nation are safe. And that means not just our borders. That means our ports, our airports. That means implementing the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission other than just simply talking about keeping us safe. I think we all know it is irrational to think that you just simply will take everyone who's here, 12 million people, and just simply pile them up somewhere and take them. That's just not going to happen. We need to be able to create a process where people move toward legal permanent resident status, move toward citizenship by essentially getting at the back of the line. Those who have committed any crimes or felonies or are not appropriate for our citizenship process will have to leave the nation. But we have to allow people to get out of the shadows and become part of society so that they can become contributing members of society. What about that 700-foot proposed wall? You know, um, I think there were a couple quotes that probably made it more simple. It's rhetoric. There ain't no wall high enough to keep someone who needs to, wants to, come to this country from coming. They're going to go over the wall, under the wall, through the wall. We have to, again, economic, let's just think about this. There is a structural difference in economy between Latin America, Mexico, and the United States. Ever since we lived in caves, if there was a better cave over there, you'd try to go there. That isn't to say that we don't have to deal with and create immigration policy, we have to secure our borders. We have to secure our borders, but offense is a political way to do this before an election, not a rational way to either secure our borders or to deal with immigration policy. All right, I've got a question here concerning, uh, concerning energy and energy uh, independence. Uh, what is your position on how this country can achieve energy independence? And maybe tie into your answer uh, uh, looking for sources of alternative fuels, because obviously that's part of, of energy, yeah. in, uh, energy independence. Yeah. I think it's, it's probably not, it's never lost on anybody, that part of energy independence, the fact that we are so committed to foreign oil is why we've spent so much time and energy and blood and money in the Mideast. We just have to be clear about that. So as I said in my previous answer, we need to invest in the alternative energies that are the next generation next way that we power our life. That's the best way to think about it. So very specifically, let's look at where we are, either here in this valley or over in the valley on the other side of the mountains. We need to make sure that those businesses that are creating, those corporations that are creating the next generation of solar-powered solar powered energy, either facilities or infrastructures, we need to make sure that they have the resources not only to exist, but the incentives to produce at a very fast, fast pace. Let's look at the eastern, for example, the eastern Coachella Valley. Just for example, those of you who have driven out that way toward the Arizona border. 
10% of the fields out there lay fallow each year. Farmers there are not getting federal subsidies, but could be creating the crops, literally growing the crops that create biofuels. If you lived in Kansas, I don't know if any of you are from the Midwest, if you live in Kansas, you could right now buy an alternative fuel vehicle, an SUV or a car that runs on ethanol. You couldn't do that here because we don't have those infrastructures. The real, in many ways, bottom line answer, we have to create the demand. You saw what happened when suddenly there was a greater demand for hybrid vehicles when gas prices started to go up. Suddenly there were more of them in the market. If we create the demand, if we demand that our vehicles, that our homes are powered differently, it will happen more quickly. But really, this is the future. This is what's going to happen. We will run out of oil. We will run out of petroleum. This is the future. What we're talking about is a question of whether or not we're ahead of the curve or reacting to the crisis. Right now, we've been reacting to the crisis. I suggest that our federal government create the financial incentives, the economic incentives, and the real practical incentives to make sure we're investing now as opposed to reacting when we have greater prices later on. Okay, another question deals with uh, health care. Health care is obviously very costly. It's very costly when you get older in terms of drugs, and it's costly <coughs> for families to, uh, uh, to get, sometimes they don't get it from their employers. So what is your general take on the, on the issue of, of how do we lower health care costs yeah. for most Americans, and how do we provide decent health care for most Americans? Um, again, extrapolating on my statement before, Right now, the federal government cannot, is not in a position to negotiate lower drug prices, negotiate drug prices for you, even in the same way that the VA does, that the Veterans Administration does. We need to make it possible for the federal government to negotiate drug prices that would lower the costs of prescription drug care. Many of you know who are either part of or have read about the Medicare Part D plan that within it had a gap in coverage that meant that about two weeks ago, literally millions of seniors and disabled across this nation fell in to this donut hole and suddenly had none of their prescriptions taken care of, none of their prescriptions covered by any insurance. The real answer, single-payer health care. Single-payer health care, like is being done in Massachusetts, like is being done to some extent in Oregon, and again, like is being done in nations all around the world, except for here. When people ask me, and again, it's they're simple answers, why isn't this happening? Because it is in the best interest of the pharmaceutical companies, the best interest of health insurance companies, to lobby their hearts out to make sure it doesn't happen. That's the bottom line. And when someone says, how do you pay for it? How do you afford it? I have two answers. How do you not afford it? How do you not do this for your people in a society? And second, give me those $200 million a day. $200 million a day in Iraq. We can never forget the amount of money we are spending that could be spent on our domestic priorities. And I don't know too many people, Republican, Democrat, Independent, who would argue that health is not a domestic priority. Okay, the next issue is a real controversial one. I love those. You know which one that is. That's gay marriage. Oh, yeah. That is, uh, that's become a national political issue. Uh, obviously, very controversial. That goes without saying. I see you reaching for the water. <laughs> for, for me, this is not a hard one. This is not a hard one. Okay. No, so, so what's your whole issue, uh, your whole position on the issue of gay marriage, including the question is, do we need to amend the Constitution yep. to ban it, or should we not do so? I'm very clear on this. Again, this, to me, this is actually not a difficult issue. Um, and I say the same things, and those of you who have heard me speak, what I, what I say to one group is the same thing I'll say every single, every single day. It is not the role of the federal government to tell people how their families are created. Not the role of the federal government to tell you who to marry, how to marry, what your family should look like. It's not what the government ever has done. It's not what the government should be doing. Very simple. We should not amend the Constitution to tell people how to create their families. It's not the role of the federal government. Even people on the other side of many issues from me, conservatives would agree that, we, yes, certainly we want a small government, but not small enough to fit in your bedroom. <laughs> so I'm, I'm crystal clear on this. That's not my role as a legislator to tell you how to create your family. My role as a legislator is to make sure your family thrives. Make sure you have the resources, the education, the energy, the health care you need to thrive 
in the way that you've created your family. That's an easy one for me. Then you would oppose any attempt to amend the Constitution Absolutely. to ban gay marriage. Absolutely. Okay, that's about as clear as you can get. Okay. Now the next issue deals with uh, something that's uh, near and dear to me. NCLB. <laughs> no child left behind. No, or, can also be called No Child Left Behind, or No Teacher Left Standing. <laughs> so what's your general... Uh, Position on the No Child Left Behind. This I want to hear myself. Yeah. I'm a school board member. No Child Left Behind has essentially created accountability factories. And I want to cut to the chase first and then we'll be a little bit more specific. Um, no Child Left Behind, with its unfunded mandates, literally billions of dollars of unfunded mandates that have come back to states, accountability provisions that have created recipes for failing schools, teachers that are considered failing, and really failing children is at its outset, I believe at its heart, created to allow for the conversation of privatization to take place. Let's just think about that again very clearly. If you create a recipe using which your schools will fail, it allows those who simply say, look, public schools are failing. Public schools are failing. We've got to privatize them. We've got to go to voucher programs. We've got to go to private education. We can't have public schools because they don't work. When you look at the amount of unfunded mandates within No Child Left Behind, when you look at the provisions there which are really not about young people being held accountable and being tested and moving toward excellence in school, the accountability provisions within, provisions within No Child Left Behind don't do that. They actually hamstring teachers, and I hear this every day. Again, I don't care whether they're Democrat, Republican, Independent. I hear this from educators on a daily basis. I don't meet one educator that is pleased with NCLB. Not one. All right, the uh, next issue. Well, I feel like I'm firing the gun here, actually, with these issues here. No, no, I love that. Uh, <laughs> privatization of the Social Security system. Oh, what's, yeah. what's your take on that? The answer is I'm adamantly against it. That's the answer. Now let me tell you why. Social Security is created and was created as a poverty prevention program, one of the most successful in our nation's history. It is a myth. In fact, let me be even more clear, it is a lie when anybody tells you that Social Security is in jeopardy. It is not. Social Security is not in jeopardy of going bankrupt. Social Security is not in jeopardy of becoming broke. It's simply not. Even when you read the Social Security Trustees Report, what they're talking about is maybe 30 years, 35 years down the line, Social Security will become pay-as-you-go, meaning money comes in is the same money that goes out. They are not, even they are not talking about bankruptcy. The only people talking about bankruptcy are those who want to privatize Social Security so that money managers will make more money. Okay, got another question for you. Yeah. Money and politics. <laughs> These are great money, questions. A lot of money and politics. Yeah. All we, as we all well know, it started now even on the even on the local level, yep. and all the way through uh, state legislative races, uh, into Congress, some the presidential level. I've never seen so much money being spent on political races. A lot of money being spent <coughs> and uh, a lot of money coming in from special interests. Yep. And what is your general position on how can we limit the influence of uh, special interest groups in terms of these large contributions? Again, my thesis at, at Reed College is on campaign finance reform. So I've been thinking about this for a very long time. <clears throat> the future is public financing. Like I said, the future of alternative energy, the future of politics is public financing. I bet everything on that. It's not my future in the next 20 days. It's not next year's future, but it is the future. For a little bit of an articulation or an example of this, my opponent has already spent $1 million to save her seat. A million dollars. That's as of the report that just came out two days ago. We have raised together, my opponent and I together have raised about two million dollars. I've raised about $650,000. She's raised a little over $1.2 million. Relatively similar amounts of money. Tremendous amount of money. There is a fundamental difference. She's raising it from political action committees from the oil companies. I'm raising it from people that I meet. But regardless, there's a reason why so few people run for office. There's a reason why so few people run for federal office, and that's because it is such a financial commitment to raise the money that it needs to run a race. And I think that if we could have, and I don't know many of you, but you should be able to run for Congress if you want. 
You should be able to run for Congress when you want. Benny, my goodness, you should be able to run for Congress. But the reason people don't is because it is hard as a challenger. In fact, very few challengers around the country have raised what I've raised. I've been raising money my whole life for philanthropic purposes and nonprofits, so asking people for money is not a problem for me. But for many people, it's impossible to raise the kind of money necessary to mount a campaign like we have run. I'm absolutely in favor of campaign finance reform. Okay, this is going to be the final question today because we don't want to hold him too much longer and hold up uh, Paul and sure. Rita uh, too much longer. If you get elected to Congress, what are you going to do to help the economy in Riverside County? Mm. Well, that's a great question to answer. I will make sure that we are no longer second to last in receipt of federal dollars. Second to last, we need to not be in that position. We need to be able to have the dollars we need for our schools, for our seniors, for our roads. And in case any of you are wondering, well, does that just simply mean you have to get on the right committee? No. It isn't only money that goes through committees. It's money that comes from federal grants to our schools, to our seniors, to our infrastructure. You need to have a member of Congress that will work to get that money here. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank David uh, very much. Democratic candidate, of course, uh, Dr. Rita Ramirez Dean, former educator, of course, and of course, Paul Cook, who is the Republican candidate, uh, a very good representative of the Republican Party in terms of what they stand for statewide, and a very good representative of what the Democrats stand for statewide. So we're going to see a real good contrast here between the two parties as well as the two candidates, which is, which is obviously very educational. Um, is that the ladies first, or I'm Paul ready. Russell, or? <laughs> My name is Dr. Rita Ramirez Dean, and I'm better than Dr. Phil. I am hip, I'm cool, and I'm looking good. And what does that mean? It means that if you're hip, you know that education is number one. There's nowhere to go if you don't have it. What does that mean in regards to education? We need more money in local hands. We need to freeze tuition. We need to do the reverse of Prop 98. Take 60 cents of every dollar that has been earmarked education and leave it in local hands and let the state look for its own money. How are we going to raise the standards? We're going to take the 10 highest states, take the average of the cost that they spend per student, and that will be our standard. And the money that we keep, and this standard is the gap that the state of California needs to give back to education. So we will get have money without having to beg for it, we're going to have a higher standard because we're going to set it by taking the average. But in higher education, you have to understand that for every tuition dollar, 97 cents goes to the state and three cents stays in the institution. I am community college from 1972 until 2004. I have taught for 38 years. I have been there and I've seen it. And what I'm telling you now, no school can run on three cents. So every time you pay more money, the state gets it, but not the institution. So for higher education, we want to take 60 cents of every tuition dollar. You pay for your education, it should stay here and serve you. 60 cents stays here, we send the 40 up to Sacramento. Look what's happening at the state university level. Do you know that 10 years ago, the state was paying 50% of the budget? Today, it only gives 20%. So what are they doing to Californians? They have set a quota for California residents. Because they don't have the money, only so many Californians can go to the state university. And the rest of the money is made up by out-of-staters. So you and I are paying our taxes so people from out-of-state can come and enjoy our education. This is wrong. So let's put education number one. Students are number one, not money. And therefore the mind is more important than the money itself. So we will freeze tuition. We will give more money to K through 12 and higher education. We will put students first, for they are our future. Then the second thing, I said to you, I said to you I'm cool. I'm cool because I know that if I have money in my pocket, I can do anything and everything. But you can't not live on a minimum wage. I support a living wage. And I am against outsourcing. That means American jobs for Americans. 
Isn't that simple? It says that everybody will have a job and everybody's going to make enough money to support their families, to have the dignity and not have to decide as because the gasoline went up. I went to State of Brothers. I wanted some pairs. Two dollars for three pairs. What happens if you have four kids? Hmm? Somebody doesn't get a piece of fruit for that day or for the week? Why am I saying this? Because we have to have a wage that will allow a family to survive and have some benefits of their labor. I'm also for small businesses. Small businesses, the first five years are the hardest. They generally don't make it. So what I want to do is low interest or interest only. My idea is this. Take two unemployed individuals, put them in a small business for a period of three years so they can be reskilled, retaught, and have a new career and give the owner of the small business up to five years to pay it off. If they hire the unemployed, they only pay the interest and not the principal. And the last I said, looking good. Okay? Looking good says good life is good health. I believe in universal health care. We cannot afford to go to the doctor. Our children, when they're sick, shouldn't have to suffer because there's no money to take them to the doctor. I'm saying to you that the Declaration of Independence gave us our definition of the American dream. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of all happiness. Education, a decent job, and good health. So, I am the triple S threat. S because I'm smart. BA, MA, EDS, PhD, eight areas of study, GPA 3.7, and 38 years of experience in education. I have worked out there, I have done everything, and I have studied just like you. And I know what it takes in order to survive. The other second S, okay, is super. I'm a super macho woman. And I'm going to tell you why. My feet have been tied, I've been stabbed in the back, my neck has been cut and set on fire. I'm union. I'm CTA. I'm CRTA. I have stood up and fought for working families all my life. I have defended the staff, I've defended students, I have defended education because I am the product of the American dream. And the last is Sharp. Sharp says that I know where it's at. Education, a decent employment, small businesses for communities, and last, good health care. I represent people, Californians. I'm here to tell you, I'm third generation, native Californian. I'm well educated, and I have 38 years of experience in education. The only reason I'm here is that I love education and I love students. When I saw my students suffering because they could start and not finish because of tuition going up, my heart felt I had to say something to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Obviously, my name is Paul Cook. If uh, you hear my vocabulary, uh, I have, I'm a product of the, the Eastern School System. So, as you all know, I-D-E-A is pronounced idea, and uh, there's no such thing as car, it's ca, and things like that. So if I regress back into my New England vocabulary, I'll apologize. Uh, I went to school, obviously, back east, went to college, University of Connecticut, Southern Connecticut University. Then I went to the United States Marine Corps where I stayed for 26 years. I was an infantry officer. I had, in college, I had a, a degree in education slash history. I got out of the Marine Corps after 26 years and I found that I didn't have many skills. You know, I knew how to field strip an M60 machine gun and a few other things, but that was about it. So I went back, at that time I had retired from the Marine Corps base at 29 Palms. And I went back to school, just as many of the, the people in this room, some of the older students. I went to Cal State, and I put on a beanie, and I was the oldest student in the class. Uh, a little bit nervous the first day going into class because you really wonder whether you can compete with the younger generation. So I went to, uh, to Cal State, and I got a uh, degree. I got a, a master's in public administration. I was uh, the outstanding, outstanding graduate student. Why? Because I was any smarter? No. 
I think that I had learned such traits as self-discipline. I think it, my whole life had changed. You know, my, I'll be very candid with you. My priorities, I think, when I was younger were perhaps football, girls, maybe beer, not, not alcoholic beer, not necessarily in, in, in that order. But when, when you uh, go through certain experiences, as I did in the Marine Corps, your priorities change. I got a uh, scholarship to uh, University of California, Riverside, where I enrolled in the PhD program, and I was there for five years. I did get my master's in political science. I did not finish my dissertation. I'm still working on it. I'll probably be working on it till the day I die. <laughs> Sound familiar, Willie? Yeah, sure does. Uh, and uh, someday I'm going to get it done. And then I, uh, I uh, started teaching. I taught at uh, COD, College of the Desert. I uh, started teaching at Copper Mountain College. And along the way, I was the adjunct faculty at Cal State, where I taught uh, public administration. And I also taught terrorism and political violence at UCR. So I think I got an extensive background in education as well. But I also got involved in local politics because, uh, you, you know, you, you can talk about the, the weather, but you can't make any, you can't do anything about it. Well, if you want to complain about the politics, at least do something. First and foremost, you you got to vote. But go to a meeting, send letters, complain, agitate. Frederick Douglass, by the way, the great abolitionist, you know, somebody asked him many years ago, what can you do to make a difference? And he said, agitate, agitate, agitate. And I try to tell that to all my students, regardless of your political philosophy. Agitate, agitate, agitate. Anyway, ran for office eight years ago. I've been a mayor, mayor pro tem. Small community by the, the name of Yucca Valley. Some of you have never heard of it, although Rita, I think, knows, knows it very well since she drives through it every day, or at least I... And hopefully she shops there so we can get the sales tax. And it's, uh, it's not the end of the earth, but uh, some people say you can, uh, you can see it from there. Uh, wh why am I running? Well, it's the same thing, or the same reason why I was in the Marine Corps. And it was the same reason why I, I went into teaching. I thought I could make a difference. You know, we're going to have different political philosophies, different interpretations. But I think you have to have that, that desire to make a difference in other people's lives. I think I tried to do that for 26 years in the Marine Corps. Uh, I think it, I, I made that, that same commitment as an educator, as a college professor of history and political science and public administration. You know, the, the money, at least the, at Copper Mountain College, they probably pay more down here, but it's not great. And you shouldn't be in it for the money. You should be in it to make a difference. You know, the community college system, and I'm, I'm giving an ad for the community. You know, I've taught it in the UC system, the Cal State system. That is really where the trenches are. Because that's where you do get a chance to make a difference. We're, we're, we're a number of kids or even older students that have come back to school, want to be educated, and you can kind of make a difference in their life. You can give them a sense of purpose and hopefully you can give them a, an education. And there is a major bond issue on the ballot, 1D. And what is your position on Proposition 1D, the state school bond? We can start, uh, start with that. Rhea, what's, what's your position on it? Vote yes. Yes? Okay, yes. Okay. That's simple enough, isn't it? Okay, Paul? Well, I, I strongly support it as well as the other infrastructure bonds. And I, I hope you don't stop with just the school bond. You know, there's such issues on there as transportation. You know, the infrastructure that we have out here, which in Riverside County in California is in sadly need of repair. We've got some major, major water issues. I think. Uh, Many, I don't know if you realize it or not, but uh, one of the worst areas in terms of flooding, obviously, was New Orleans, and that was proven during Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina. The other is the levee system uh, in Central California, and, and most of you know that that water is our, our, our lifeline. If we don't repair that, 
so I would also hope that you support that also. Did you want to make an additional comment about the uh, proposition? The proposition of 1G is very important because it's the beginning. It's just the beginning. You know, the population of students, the need of facilities, the question of enrollment, the question of teachers, and all of that encompasses education, is that we have to look to the future, not just for today or for tomorrow, but for to the future. And if we don't put the money where it comes, in people, in students, the future of the United States, the future of California, then we're cutting ourselves off from life. So I would tell you right now, I am voting 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, yes. Why? Because it has to do with a better life for, better, for more people. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next issue I'd like to raise, even though it's, it's mostly federal, that'd be immigration, of course. Uh, what should the state of California do about the, about the immigration issue? What can we do on the state level about the, about the immigration issue uh, here in California? Uh, Paul, let's let you go first, since we went first. Last time. Well, first of all, on, on immigration, I think you have to realize that uh, everyone in this in this room is is a product of immigration. That's how our our whole country was built. The, the problem I have with this issue, it's very very simple, and that is illegal immigration. You know, I think that both the Democrats and the Republicans have ducked this issue. You know, the, the, the program that, that, that we have is not working. You know, I'll refer to the, the uh, Democratic candidate for Congress. He was absolutely right about the fact that economic issues have driven this, that, that people do not want to solve this. The process is flawed. I mean, if you want to come into this, th this country and you want to go through this process, it is very, very cumbersome. The bureaucracy is winning. It needs to be fixed. But I really, really wonder whether individuals from both political parties have the, have the political courage to address it. You know, I, I have to put it in a plug because I, I, I teach history. And you see throughout American history sometimes where uh, the founding fathers, other people, they address the easy issues and they don't address the hard issues. Perhaps the greatest from an American history standpoint is the fact that the Founding Fathers never addressed the issue of slavery. It was going to go away. You know, it, it wasn't going to be there. They didn't have the political, they knew it was wrong. They knew it was horrible. And yet, you have to have the courage of your convictions to attack some of these things, even though it's unpopular. And of course, you know, uh, African Americans suffered for years. Uh, you know, I, it's part of the reason, believe it or not, why I'm a Republican. The Republican Party is and was the party of abolition. And, you know, my greatest hero was Abraham Lincoln. Okay, Rita, you want to take that question? What can we on the state level do about the illegal? On the state issue? level. On the state level, yeah. Number one, I don't believe in building a wall. We tore down the Berlin Wall, and it was supposed to be the last wall. Walls do not keep people out, and they don't necessarily keep them in. Secondly, I don't believe in the use of the National Guard. They are there to protect the state, not to take care of the so-called border. But I would say to you in regards to the undocumented, if you enforce the law as the laws are on the books, and it says no employer is to hire an undocumented. This is a law that was passed in the federal government. This law has never been enforced. If you do the crime, you do the time. Why aren't employers not looking into the history whether these individuals that they hire are citizens or not? That's the law. And now I believe in the law because my bachelor's is in history and my master's is political science and I also taught government, Western City of U.S. history and women in American history. So what I'm saying in regards to the state, the state, because it isn't, this is a federal issue, and we can discuss it, we can debate it, but we cannot do anything about it except go to Washington, D.C. and bring the debate to the office of those individuals who can vote. On the other hand, I will say to you, I am not an immigrant and I'm not a refugee. I'm not from New Orleans, but I did graduate from LSU, Baton Rouge, okay, between Katrina and Dennis. I am a third generation. Native California. 
And my ethnic background is that I am a Mexican American. I know that individuals who come to the United States come because they are in need. I can see and understand the need of people wanting to take care of their homes and families. Therefore, I do agree with President Bush on a visa, but I call it a working visa. May I tell you my plan? Uh, real quick? Yeah, working, real, real quick. quick. Okay. If you give a working permit for people to come in, they can go to the Department of Human Resources, sign up. If they find a job, they go to the Department, excuse me, of Immigration, and then to the Department of Human Resources. We have a database of people who are working, and we know where they are. If they have a visa, they can leave this country without crossing the border at night and without being shot in the back. If they really want to become citizens, at the end of the year, they can file to be a legal resident. At the end of three, they can file for being a citizen. I do not believe in giving citizenship or my country away for free. People who come here have to earn to become Americans. But I set a limit of seven years. Okay. I think it's a good thing if we change the law. Okay, another issue is the uh, state prison system, which is, which is overcrowded. It is a tremendously expensive uh, system, obviously. And nobody wants a, at least most parts of the state don't want a prison in their backyard, but uh, since we are committed in this state to being tough on crime, that means that naturally you've got to be putting more people in prison. I mean, the two things go together. So, so what is your take as to what we should do about the problem of, of building prisons, financing prisons, location of prisons, uh, etc.? And uh, I believe, Rita, you, you can take that one first. Well, I would like to say one more thing. We have to look at rehabilitation. The question is that many persons who have been found to be criminal, you have to look at the case. And we know that we have the three strikes, correct? And in many cases, that third strike puts a person in prison for life. Therefore, the number of crimes that are increasing because we have made it, as you say, stiffer. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're solving the problem of the human weakness. It doesn't say that we're going to make a difference in the human being who's being sent to prison. Therefore, I feel that the question of prisons is not a question of building them. It's a question of rehabilitating how you do the punishment, how you carry it out, and the question of the person and not the system. We need to look at the human being who has been found to be a criminal. And I know that living in 29 Palms, they have often spoke about having it in the desert. Okay? Do you know that we have about 30% of all felons in the high desert right now? So where are they being sent anyway, if not out to us? So. Does that solve the problem? No. I do not believe that uh, we should be spending more money for prisons and less for education. Okay, Paul, what is your take on the uh, prison system uh, problem? Well, it's, uh, ironically enough, it's uh, an issue that I disagree with our governor on because uh, one of the things that uh, got him in uh, a little bit of trouble, as it should have, and I'll say it right up front, was uh, when he didn't support the retirement system and the increase for the prison guards, the prison guard association, which I think you talked about a difficult job. It's one of the most difficult. I, unfortunately, prisons, you, you know, it's not a top priority on a lot of people's list. It's like, oh, we got to have it, and I don't want to talk about it. We'll talk about something else. You have got to address it. You cannot throw everybody together into a prison. You take an impressionable 18, 19 year old and you throw them in there with the hardened criminals, guarantee you have just made a hardened criminal. You have to have more and more prisons that are different. You can't, as I said, uh, some of them are uh, obviously have a reputation for attracting the, the hardcore, the, 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 the felon that is never going to change. But you're absolutely correct. You have got to make sure in any way, shape, or form that you have an environment for an intervention. Because if you don't have the intervention in terms of psychological counseling, education, 
uh, you know, explanation of how you got there, understanding the problem, what you're going to have is just somebody who's going to be back in there forever and ever until the day he or she dies. Okay, the next issue I'd like to raise is transportation. Transportation is a major issue in Riverside County. I mean, we all know that. And it's really a big issue in this assembly district. I happen to live in this particular assembly district. So you're talking to me when you're talking about all of these issues, including transportation. And I want to know, when you get to Sacramento, what are you going to do about the transportation problems in this assembly district so people can actually drive around and get to places? And uh, Paul, you're first. Well, you know, I think I told you I just came from a uh, transportation meeting. I, I'm not on the Riverside, I'm on San Bernardino uh, Associated Government Transportation Commission. And it's probably one of the most important committees that you have because it's, it's very, very complex. It's very, very convoluted because you're talking about multiple pots of money. You're talking about uh, federal money with such acronyms as Safety Lou. I, I don't know who comes up with these acronyms, but they're absolutely ridiculous. And you have to go to a special school, I think, to learn all these acronyms. And it is, it's very, very complex. And you ask what, what I'm going to do when I'm going. First of all, I, I think you've got to rock the boat. And uh, one of the things, the first thing that's going to happen is, unfortunately, some of the gentlemen at Caltrans are probably going to have a stroke if I get elected because of Part of the agitation that I've given about some of the roads in San Bernardino County. The process is broken. The bureaucracy is broken. You know, the, there's roads right now, they're talking about them. The, the sad thing is they're not going to be built in your lifetime. They're not even going to be built in your grandkids' lifetime. And that's sad that uh, the cost of, of doing this, our planning, it's become very, very bureaucratic. We, we've got to fast track this. We have to identify that California continues to grow, whether we like it or not. You know, 36 million, we're larger than Canada. You know, you, you, you guys know the stats better than I do, and you're absolutely correct. Uh, you, the problem is that if you live in this assembly district, you know that before you put a road in, the houses, everything else is there, and then you've got the traffic and you're trying to go back and correct the situation. You've got to have those plans in place right now. If you don't, you're going to you're going to have astronomical costs, and as I said, you're never going to have a bill. Okay, reader, transportation. Transportation. I believe in master plans, and I want to just mention one real quick. And that was in 29 Palm. We had a developer who decided that he was going to put six houses on one acre. Our master plan says one house per acre. 250 people stood up at the city hall meeting and said, no way. Guess what? It's only one house per one acre. The developer didn't get it. So in regards to transportation, this is a question of grassroots. It's a question of communities getting together, going and, and speaking their voice, and saying that they need to have a master plan that will also look into the problem of where are the streets, where is the population, where are your green zones. Where are the areas that you're going to be able to walk and not have to travel? But the problem we also have here goes back further back to a governor by the name of Reagan, so that you understand what happened. We used to have money for transportation, so that bridges that had to be built, roads that had to be built, or roads that had to be taken care of, the money was there. It was a separate budget both for education and transportation. But all the money was in this budget, and Governor Reagan took it all upon himself and put it in the general budget. So there is no priority for transportation. The first thing that I would like to look at is the surtax on gasoline. The surtax on gasoline is strictly for transportation. I want to know how much money it is and how much more do we need to tax the gasoline price. Because that's where the money is supposed to be, and that's the money that we should have as priority number one. But I will say to you that in regards to transportation, you need to have local commissions that have a voice with Caltrans so that it's a direct communication of saying, these are our priorities, this is where we're lacking, these are the words, these are the roads that need to be taken care of. 
But when you don't speak, no one hears. And this whole issue that we're going on, of course, uh, parental notification for minors when it comes to getting abortions. Because I want to bring out some of the, uh, hopefully, a philosophical difference between you two, because you're sounding a bit too much alike. Okay. <laughs> a little bit. It's, you know, I want you to start contrast. And maybe that's an issue where we can see a real strong difference between the two of you. Well, maybe not. Uh, parental notification, uh, minors being able to, to get abortions with or without parental notification. Okay. Uh, Rita? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Rita. Rita. Okay. Roe versus Wade. This is a question of Roe versus Wade. And I'm going to start. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And in the seventh day, he rested. And between those seven days, he created man and then woman. And he said, don't go and eat that apple. But guess what? The grass was greener on the other side and they ate the apple. God gave a choice to both Adam and Eve. He didn't say, absolutely, you will not do it. So man has always been given a choice, if you once look at religion, philosophy of life, between life and death, good and evil. But whatever you do, you must be responsible for your own actions. Now, you all agree on that, correct? I mean, I took it straight out of the Bible, so I haven't created anything. On the other hand, let's look at the law. We are all Americans, and therefore we have all the same rights. The right of making our own decisions. Because as we were created by God, we have also been given the right of citizenship and civil liberties. Therefore, as a woman, I have the right to my body and to my mind and to my soul. Whether you like it or not, I do have the right of choice. So I'm going to say this to you. You don't feed me, you don't take care of me, and I don't give you a right to my body, so read my lips. Get out of my life. So this is no for parental notification. This is for notification. It says, okay. right. when a human being makes a decision, they have the right to make it for themselves. Okay, Paul, let's get you in quickly here. This is the, uh, well, this is the controversial question. Yes. And uh, obviously, I also respect women's choices. Griswold versus Connecticut, by the way, uh, also identified when the birth control issue. And the reason I mentioned that is from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take the contrary viewpoint because we're talking about notification involving a minor. I'm sorry, I'm a parent. And I think until that child is 18 years old, I want to be involved in that child's life. When they're 18, when they're older, yes, I hope by that time, that child, that adult, that woman, that man, that person, you know, if I've done my job and my wife has done her job, then those kids are going to make their own decisions, just as I had to do. But I have a real issue about minors. There's got to be a line in the sand. And obviously, I'm going to take the contrary point of view and say, yes, I think the parents should be notified while they are still minors. Yes, thank you very much. I'd like to thank Paul. I'd like to thank Rhea.